to me was like just the biggest rabbit hole I went down throughout my PhD is just learning all of these different ways that seemingly obvious conclusions that you can draw from data in a lot of different ways are actually way more complex and sometimes completely counterintuitive to what you would expect. This is an evidence-based podcast when, when, when it's convenient. Yeah, right. Exactly. Um, but when interpreting evidence, there, there's more that goes into it than just taking a study finding and just assuming that that is correct. There's a lot of fog of war in <laughs> terms of in, interpreting studies and also applying the concepts we get from studies. And there are some basic ones that you could probably find on the internet if you do a, a search for it, such as... Um, just, you know, understanding what statistical versus clinical significance is, is like a, a common one, which I see you kind of cringing a little bit inside because <laughs> that, that even that in and of itself is a, a little bit of an oversimplification sure. or, you know, just thinking about the, the relevance of the, the participants used in the study, right? There's, there's a lot of basic ones, but I think there are, there's maybe another rung of the ladder in terms of things to, to consider when interpreting training studies um, that are often overlooked by a lot of folks and maybe even your favorite evidence-based influencer is making one or multiple of these mistakes. So can't think of a better a better person to take us on this ride <laughs> than you, Zach. Um, and I'm looking at your outline for this. <laughs> this could be five separate podcast yeah, episodes. Right. So right. have fun attacking this one. Cool. So like Josh said, I think um, – one thing that has been helpful throughout the PhD process, I think we can both be firsthand and, and kind of talking about is just how much you realize that you're making inappropriate conclusions from things. And just like, I always talk about just like the, I, I should write a, write a, like a blog post or something like just how data deceives us. And just like that, that to me was like just the biggest rabbit hole I went down throughout my PhD is just learning all of these different ways that seemingly obvious conclusions that you can draw from data in a lot of different ways are actually way more complex and sometimes completely counterintuitive to what you would expect. And it's just made me value <laughs> the times that my head has got slammed into a door that I'm trying to go in because I've been making an error and someone corrects me for it, whether it's a colleague or whether it's somebody on my committee and, and, and through just independent reading. And so, um, you know, when we, you know, look at the, across the, the landscape of social media, you come across a lot of these same misinterpretations for, for better or for worse. And I don't think they're malicious by any means. I don't think people necessarily are, are always intentionally misinterpreting things, but I do think kind of talking through some of these can be helpful so you can kind of be on the lookout for potentially some of these cases of misinterpretation and aid your own interpretation of training studies to, to hopefully come closer to the truth. So, and this one has got a lot of discussion recently, um, but this is kind of a more umbrella way of describing it is just what I'm going to call the false attribution fallacy. And so anytime you have a study or a group of studies, it's really, really, really tempting to go through the methods section with a fine tooth comb and really try to find out why this study may slightly differ from the other studies in kind of the related area of research and may attribute that to the exercises or the participants or the length of the training intervention or, or these numerous characteristics that you could probably drive yourself insane going through and even sometimes really strongly convince yourself that this this is why it's different. It all makes sense. It all makes sense. If you, if you comb through hard enough, there's a reason. And I think that is a really, really noble pursuit. And I think it comes from a good place of really trying to be detail oriented and understand the studies at a very, very high level. And I never think that should be sacrificed. But I think it's really important to realize it's necessary, but not sufficient. Exactly. I think it's nece it's it's really important to realize that none like you could find these different factors and a perfectly valid and likely and expected explanation is just what I'm going to call the variance demon that's just kind of lurking in the background. So I think the concept of, of variance that's gotten a lot of like talk recently has been has been sampling variance. So sampling variance, I'll kind of go through these each quickly. Sampling variance is just the fact that let's say we have this overarching population that's in the clouds. This is kind of a, an assumption that we typically make um, in research that we're trying to gain information about a population. But it's not easy to obtain all the participants or all the individuals that exist in that population. So we have to take a subset. So every time we take a subset, you're 
are going to have some variability in the subset that you gather from that population. And so necessarily, there's going to be some variability every time you take that subset. If we're able to get the entire population at once, there is no variability. We know what the population is going to tell us. And so when we have small sample research, the variance that we get from each one of these samples that we, that we have is going to be greater and greater and greater. And so even if we know what the population, you know, their, their mean is or, or, or whatever we're trying to calculate with a given study, the difference between two groups. Even if we know what that is, because of the fact that we have small sample research, we're going to have a lot of variability that may lead some studies to find positive findings, some studies to have negative findings, purely because of the sampling variance and nothing to do with the underlying reality of the matter. And so that's the first thing to consider. The next one is measurement error. And that's something I think people have like an intuitive sense of is that even we have, you know, lab grade tools, we measure the exact same quality twice that we like assume to have the same true value. Like for example, if I was to measure your, your quadriceps twice or three times in a row, it's not like your quadricep is changing its true value in the span of 30 seconds when I'm measuring it. So any differences between those measurements, I'm going to assume is some sort of user error. And so those types of, of, of uh, errors can, in small sample research, can sometimes pool on one side of the direction. Maybe it's going to systematically upwardly bias the, the, the measurements that we're making or downwardly bias the measurements that we're making. The point is, typically what we're assuming is that if we have enough of a sample size and, and we're able to estimate this measurement error well, it's going to kind of wash out. It's going to be normally distributed and it's not something that we're going to necessarily need to um, worry about our ability to gain that information that we're, that we're looking for. But in smaller sample research, things can happen where greater measurement error is just going to lead to findings that we wouldn't expect. And the same thing goes um, for sampling variance, like we just said, more measurement error, more the effects that we observe in every individual study is just going to bounce around even more. And then finally, we have another source of variability called biological variability that can also influence the, the results that we get. Um, you know, these are the just the natural fluctuations and whatever we're measuring, those are going to naturally vary over time. And again, the point of this is all of these sources of variability are constantly lurking in the background anytime we do a study and are magnified when we have small sample research that is usually low in power that we often have in exercise science research. So instead of attributing the differences between studies to these exact method dif methods differences that we see or we may think is what's leading to the difference, it very well could be and often probably is the case. It's just the variance demon that's kind of lurking in the background that's probably the true, the, the true uh, explaining factor of the matter. And we would just be falsely attributing the differences to something else if we don't acknowledge that. So I think that's, that's the first thing to just kind of have in the back of your mind anytime you're interpreting studies, particularly with small samples um, as an exercise science. Anything on that one? No, I think you nailed it. I'll give an example of sure. one that uh, has actually caught on quite a bit. Mm -hmm. And I also agree with it. I tend to think it's true, but I think it's an example potentially potentially of false attribution fallacy, as you're mm -hmm. calling it, is in your meta regression on the effects of proximity to failure on muscle growth, you had a sub-analysis of different loads. So um, you have low, 30, moderate, yeah, 30, low, moderate, high load, something like that. Yeah. Call it 30, 50, 90, something, nine, like, that. Yeah. something like that. Something like, I can't remember the numbers. Yeah. But nonetheless, basically you saw that the, the slope of the relationship did tend to change mm -hmm. depending on the load. Mm -hmm. um, so at higher loads, the effect of proximity to failure on muscle growth seemed to be less. So proximity to failure seems to be less of a consideration um, when training with higher loads to maximize muscle hypertrophy. However, based on the nature of those sub-analyses, mm -hmm. there is also variance amongst the studies that independently look at that question that could be causing that to show up because to my knowledge, there are few studies, if any. Lubicius, Lis good one. Yep. Direct. Is there, I think that might be the only it's one. It's not very many. No. Yeah. Call it one to three. Sure. There's like one that. to three studies that directly look at the question of how does load mediate mm -hmm. the effect of proximity to failure on muscle growth. Yep. And I think I speak for you in saying that those sub-analyses are exploratory and hypothesis generating as opposed to conclusion generating, right? Yep. So you could falsely attribute the effects of load from that sub-analysis, even though, again, there's other sources from that variance demon going on there. And I struggle pointing that one out because I do think it, that is the case. Like, yeah. I think it just checks out from other areas of research as well. Yeah. And I think it's okay to use a visual of that sub-analysis to kind of make a point, even though it's not 
like I get it, yeah. but I do think that's an example of where in evidence-based fitness we can like use research when maybe we just should say what we think. Yeah, that's what do you think about that? Yeah, I think meta-analysis is a, is a tough one because the meta-analysis is a tough one. It's particularly in the case of sub-analysis or moderator analysis. The point you're bringing up is that, and the question ultimately is, if there are no other factors that are quote unquote causing the studies that have higher loads. It's not causally designed for that. Right. If, if there's no if there's no other confounding variable essentially that yeah. let's say studies with heavier loads also tend to use greater volumes or something like that. Something something to that effect. If there's no other like clouding causal variable that's systematically biased in that direction. So like again, the volumes really tend to be higher in the higher load conditions and the, the really tend to be lower in the lower load conditions. Something to that effect. If it's kind of normally distributed and there's kind of you know noise that um, kind of cancels each other out in a way, it's less of a concern. And with meta-analysis, we're trying to take all of those studies and try to detect the signal from the noise if there is one. So if there's a best case for trying to find attribution that is true to these kind of systematic differing factors, but as you say, there's kind of this unknown factor of, is there another variable that's yeah. confounding that relationship that we can glean from it? Or so variables, as you, plural. Exactly. And, and so what you say is, is, is exactly true, is that it can be hypothesis generating, it can be quite literally better than nothing, but you have to acknowledge the fact that there also could be something that's completely biasing that relationship and it could be incorrect. So I think those types of relationships, this is something I'm workshopping, so don't take this too literally. I think moderate analyses are helpful when they are first first and foremost, are very strong theory driven in which ones we're looking at. That's the first thing. Because when you have a strong theory or, or strong um, a priori predictions about what that may be the case, I think you can have better theoretical and rationale to take that with a little bit more confidence if you do find what you would expect. That doesn't necessarily mean it's it's devoid of these limitations that we just discussed, not necessarily, but coming in with a strong theory and predictions on what you may expect, I think gives more credence to it because mm -hmm. um, it's more biological plausibility, more theoretical plausibility. And then ultimately, if you do find the signal and you're able to to verify there doesn't seem to be any massive candidates of, of strong confounding. I, I think that's not a unreasonable take to use that in practice, but yeah. it's very hard to verify that without direct evidence. Now, in this case, like I said, I think there's one to three examples of direct examinations of the question, so I don't think it's totally unreasonable along with the fact I think yeah. it makes theoretical sense, but you're totally spot on in the sense that to some degree that attribution should come with a massive asterisk that yeah. I didn't even do a great job communicating yeah. before I thought about this more.